start? Any yeah, we are, we are actually live now, so if you don't mind tweeting, Steve, that would be great. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Naveen Baswani, online producer with The Agenda with Steve Pakin. Um, welcome back. Hope you, everyone had a good long weekend, and we're going to get started uh, immediately with, it, with our chat with uh, Steve today about Ontario politics. Steve, thank you for joining us, and I do have one question in the queue right now, which I will get to immediately, but you can, uh, you can say hello if you don't mind, Steve. Hello, I don't mind. There you go. And let's get right to it. Uh, I've got a question from Mark. Thank you, Mark, for uh, sending that in. I'm just publishing it to the blog, Steve. Here it is. As someone, Mark writes, as someone who lives within two kilometers of Toronto's waterfront, Portland's energy center, a natural gas plant, I have no problem with it being a clean source of local power for the GTA. What was the issue with locating similar plants in Oakville and Mississauga? Why did all three parties, in quotes, cave to the locals during the election when the costs were going to be so high? Uh, this is a wonderfully uh, difficult and meaty question that you've asked, and let me see if I can go through this. It was the Liberals who made the decision, since they have been in government for the past nine years, to build those power plants, their gas-fired power plants, so um, theoretically less polluting than the coal fire plants they're designed to replace. Uh, it was their decision, the Liberals, to build it uh, in Oakville and in Mississauga. And for a while, we're told that wasn't a big problem. Then, as the years went along and more people moved into areas that were going to be close to where the power plants were supposed to be built, there came a greater cry from the community that, you know what, these things are built too close to where people are living, and that's not good, and so we're going to lobby, as is obviously the, the public's right, to have these things moved. Uh, the opposition agreed. The government eventually agreed. Obviously what was problematic about the most recent example was that the decision was made by the Liberals to cancel the Mississauga plant I think about five, was it a week or a week and a half before Election Day. So it, it clearly appeared to have more political uh, science than scientific science behind that decision. Um, you know. In some respects, the question you're asking can't be answered. Why, why do people in one part of the province have a bigger problem living near a gas plant than you who lives in another part of the province? I don't know. I don't know what the reason is for that. The, the reality is uh, one neighborhood didn't like it. Your neighborhood appears not to mind it. And as a result, pressure was put on. And as a result, the liberals eventually changed their minds and are moving uh, the power plants to different parts and you have heard the financial ramifications of that. I think the moving Oakville is going to cost 40 million and moving the Mississauga one is going to cost 190 million so far. All right, thank you Steve. Um, I actually, um, just give me a second Steve, I'm trying to pull a question that came on from our website. Sure. One second. You know, the, I, I guess if I can just add a postscript to this, you know, circumstances do change. And yes, it's true that all three political parties at Queen's Park uh, happen to be on the same side of this issue now. They weren't always at the beginning, but they are on the same side of it now. They all, ha whoever had won that last Ontario election a year ago, a year ago this past Saturday, uh, they all would have agreed to move it, and we would be paying for that move regardless of who won that election. But of course the two opposition parties say it wasn't our idea to put it there in the first place, therefore the Liberals should bear uh, an especially you know, egregious burden on this for deciding to put it there in the first place. Um, these, are, these are you know, really, really difficult, complicated issues to deal with, but I guess the opposition would tell you that if the Liberals had been sort of a little more straightforward and transparent with the way they were handling this in the first place, uh, it wouldn't have turned into the the scandal that it appears to be now. Okay, thanks, Steve, and thanks for bringing with me there. Um, I have a, a comment and a question from Wolf that was posted on our blog. Uh, I'm just feeding it into the chat right now, and he asks, Steve, please tell us one new thing about Queens Park that we might not already know about. <laughs> Tell you one new thing about Queen's Park you might not already know. <laughs> I'm laughing because, of course, how do I know what you know? Um, one new thing about Queen's Park. 
Well, Wolf, I suspect there are some people out there who don't know who Queen's Park is named after. Do you know who it's named after, Wolf? If you don't know, I could tell you the answer to that, and then that would be telling you something you don't know. But I don't know if you know that, so I'm not sure what to say. Uh, I say let's, let's operate under the premise that he does not know that. <laughs> okay, well, Queen's Park is named after the, the former Queen, Victoria. Uh, both the uh, building itself and, uh, of course, the, the park where people hang out just north of there. And for those of you who didn't know that it was named after Queen Victoria, then now you know something that you didn't know before. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you another little thing that maybe you didn't know before, and that is the first Prime Minister of Canada and the first Prime Minister of Ontario had the same name. I don't know how many of you didn't know that, but if you didn't know that, now you do. The first Prime Minister of Canada was John Alexander MacDonald, and the first Prime Minister or Premier of Ontario was John Sanfield MacDonald. And... Uh, I could probably continue endlessly with this historical trivia if you wanted me to, but uh, hopefully, Naveen, we've got something else in there that's going to bail me out. We do, and that uh, it, there's actually two questions from Nehru, and there's a comment also. I'm going to read the whole thing, and then I'll bring I'll, I'll address one of the questions to you, Steve. So here here it is from Nero. Thank you, Nero, for uh, sending that in. Naveen, a couple of questions. There are some claims that geothermal energy would have been the way to go for a clean, green energy plan. Thoughts? Also, why the discrepancy in cost of plant cancellations ranging from $250 million to $650 million? In regards to Chris Bentley, it seems the committee is more interested in answers to the questions as opposed to personally penalizing the minister. But what are the realistic chances of a penalty of a jail term being imposed? seems excessive for a guy who wasn't even minister when the, dishes, when the decisions were made. So, Steve, first, if you can answer the questions about um, Minister Bentley, in terms, what are the possibilities of him having to serve, a jail, serve jail time in regards to this contempt of Parliament motion? Well, as we found out last Friday, we had Maria Babbage from Canadian Press in there, and she reminded us that the fact is that once the legislature makes a decision about contempt, uh, the punishment is entirely in the hands of the 107 members of the Ontario legislature and the majority of them can choose to do what they want. Now it may be, it would be inconceivable to me that they would actually choose to put Chris Bentley, the energy minister, in jail for whatever transgressions he may have done in relation to this, all these cancellations of the gas plants. Uh, so you know, jail is an option but it's impossible for me to imagine that they would actually do that. There are other possibilities. They can, you know, smack him on the wrist and say, you must apologize to the legislature. Uh, apparently, disbarment. He's a lawyer. Disbarment is an option as well, which the Law Society of Upper Canada can look into. So there is a wide range of potential sanctions against Chris Bentley. And, of course, the great irony of all this is none of this was his doing. I mean, this is the way it works in our parliamentary system, where whoever has the portfolio at the moment is responsible for everything that happens in that portfolio and everything that has happened going back in time. So even though many of these decisions were made before Chris Bentley was the energy minister, it's on his desk right now and he has to bear responsibility for it. Uh, that's a, a real unfairness in our system, but it is also the way the system works. Uh, we saw an example of how unfair this can be uh, a couple of years ago when David Kaplan was the health minister who happened to be the health minister when all of the e-health stuff broke. All of the e-health transgressions took place before he was health minister, but it happened, quote unquote, uh, not on his watch, but while he was responsible. And as a result, he resigned. Uh, his career never really uh, came back after that, and he left politics altogether after the, um, uh, by deciding not to run in the last election. These things happen. Now, why the diverse dollar figures as a result of uh, the cancellations. Uh, some of it has to do with the fact that they, they canceled the Oakville plant relatively early into its construction and therefore uh, the, the, um, uh, the amount of money required to compensate the, the company involved for moving the plant was less. Uh, it was a, in a way it was a kind of a bad joke with the Mississauga plant insofar as uh, the Premier announced during the election campaign that he wanted to cancel the Mississauga plant and yet I believe it was the Conservatives who put a closed circuit camera on the workplace and the trucks were continuing to come in and work was continuing to happen even though the announcement had been made that uh, the plant was being cancelled. Now whether that was the company's 
doing in order to try to, you know, get a better settlement out of the government or, or you know, who knows what. I won't ascribe motive to this, but the reality is more, much more work had been done, and as a result, the, um, the dollar figure to compensate the company involved is much higher. Uh, on the first question, how, why not geothermal as opposed to something else? I don't know. I'm certainly not an energy expert, and presumably there are any any number of different uh, alternatives to uh, what we're doing right now. But for whatever reason, uh, they've gone with gas, and now they're cooking with gas somewhere else. Thank you, Steve. Um, I have a question here from Tim Logan. And here it is. Hey, I'm a left-leaning young voter who's inclined to vote NDP, but I often have to deal with parents who remind me an awful lot about Bob Ray's days as Premier and how unprepared the party was for government. Steve, how do you feel the Ontario NDP has both tried to get rid of the negative image of the last NDP government and also tried to persuade people that their long time out of their government hasn't made them now completely unprepared to return again to power? So essentially, a state of the Ontario NDP, if you wouldn't mind, Steve. Sure. Uh, y you know, a few things need to be said right off the top here. Number one, Bob Ray won an election as the first and so far only NDP premier 22 years ago. So, you know, at a certain point, presumably, there's the statute of limitations on these things, and you know, each ensuing New Democratic Party leader and party members and uh, members of the legislature. Uh, at some point are entitled to not have to say, yeah, but what about the Ray government's time? Uh, that's number one. Number two, Bob Ray's not a New Democrat anymore. And I think New Democrats would tell you today that one of the reasons that the Ray government uh, did not succeed as it wished was that it was led by a guy who really wasn't a true blue, you know, I was going to say true blue New Democrat, I guess you can't say that, a true orange New Democrat. Um, I know, for example, Howard Hampton, who succeeded Bob Ray as the leader, often said, you know, don't blame me for the fact that the Ray government, in his view, was a failure uh, because it wasn't led by a real New Democrat. It was led by a guy who obviously turned out to be uh, a liberal. So I'd say those two things at the beginning. Um, you know, there is a certain, there's a certain unfairness in requiring um, you know, current party leaders to live up to things that happened, you know, in, in some cases before they were even in politics. I mean, Andrea Horvath wasn't even in politics when Bob Ray got elected leader. Is she still carrying the can for the, for the bad brand of those years? You know, maybe she is, and if she is, it's probably not fair. Uh, you know, it, it, by the same token, you know, is, is it fair to Dalton McGinty that he should have to bear responsibility for whatever misdeeds took place during the David Peterson years from 1985 to 90 before McGinty was even elected as an MPP? I mean, at a certain point, you know, you're standing on your own foundation, your own positions, your own experience, and you've got to let, well, while it's good to know about the past, uh, you've got to let that go. So um, I think you can go back and tell your parents that. Bob Ray was elected a long time ago. He's not a New Democrat anymore. And that Andrea Horvath's party is a very different party. And, um, and see how that works. And then send me an email and let me know how they uh, took that explanation and see if they accepted it. Thank you, Tim. Uh, so you, you have some homework, so let, let us know how that goes. Um, Steve, I, I'm going to ask you a question right now. And sure. it, it stems from your uh, blog post that you wrote last week about uh, Justin Trudeau. Uh, running for the, the leadership of the Liberal Party of Canada. And I think uh, what, what you did write about was um, the negativity right off the bat that that came with his candidacy. And, and my question for you, dealing with politics in general, is in your time having covered Ontario politics, have we, have we moved to a, a more negative place in general? Do we start at negative now? And do you, do you see that changing in any case? Uh, I don't see it changing, and I, I certainly do think we're in a much more cynical, uh, vicious time now than we might have been 25 or 50 years ago. Uh, there was certainly, and, and you know, part of this is media's fault, part of this is politicians' fault. They brought a lot of this on themselves. Um, <clears throat> but I guess this stems from the fact that, that, you know, the moment Justin Trudeau put his hat into the ring, there was this orgy of... Uh, you know, stuff online, on social media, uh, in, in the newspapers the next day saying, in, you know, almost going so far as to say, how can this guy run for office? What has he ever accomplished? What's he ever done? 
you know, his resume is incredibly thin. What business does he have? If he, you know, if his name was Justin Smith instead of Justin Trudeau, would we even be looking twice at the guy? And you know, some of that is a fair point. I mean, but th those arguments have been made forever. Uh, when Teddy Kennedy first ran for the Senate in Massachusetts, uh, you know, his his opponent said to him, if his if his name was uh, Edward Moore instead of Edward Moore Kennedy, which is his full name, you know, he'd be laughed out of the building because his resume was so thin. But the reality is, uh, he was a Kennedy, and Justin is a Trudeau, and that name both helps him in some, with some people and hurts him with other people. The only reason I wrote the blog post, Naveen, was to make the point that that we actually don't have to decide right here and now, at this moment, that Justin Trudeau is not qualified for the job. Uh, the leadership vote won't take place for another six months, and he actually has six months to try to uh, impress upon us that he is ready for this job. Uh, I note with interest that Brian Mulroney, when he was in town uh, the other day for that free trade conference, uh, observing the 25th anniversary of his free trade agreement with the U.S., Mulroney said, don't underestimate this guy. He has a lot of appeal. Um, you know, now that could be the former prime minister being mischievous, but the reality is uh, Justin Trudeau has six months to show us that he is more than just a famous guy with a lot of Twitter followers. And my hunch is he will. So let's sit back and watch. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I know that wasn't about Ontario politics, but I, I appreciate you indulging me. And um, speaking of leadership, and uh, we've got a question from Doug. And I know we've addressed this before in our chats, but perhaps this is uh, Doug's first time joining us. So thank you for the question, Doug. And here it is, Steve. Uh, Tim Hudak was in trouble after the last election with his party. How's his standing now? Well, his standing right now, the, uh, I think the only thing we have to go on, uh, I guess two things. Number one, he did have to subject his leadership to a review at the Conservatives' most recent annual general meeting, and he did that, and I think if memory serves, he got 78.7% endorsement. Uh, now, to be sure, uh, leaders who want to get a high number make sure that they organize the hell out of those events and get all their supporters coming out and, you know, obviously try to dissuade their detractors from casting a negative vote. And, you know, to Hudak's credit, he managed to get a good showing of his supporters, and he got a very good number. Uh, Andrea Horvath similarly got, um, I think, just about the same number uh, when she had to submit her leadership for review. Interestingly enough, the guy who is in the worst position right now, if you believe the public opinion polls, is Dalton McGinty, and he got the highest number of all of them. Uh, I think, uh, help me, Naveen, was he around 85% support, I think, at his at his most recent event just a couple of weekends ago in Niagara Falls, in uh, Ottawa, rather? I believe that's what you wrote, Steve, yes. Yeah. So, you know, and the other thing we have to go on is, you know, if you, uh, if you look at the most recent public opinion survey, and admittedly, you know, who knows when an election will be held, so I don't know how relevant this is, but, uh, you know, Hudak's in first place. Now, he was in first place before the last Ontario election a year ago, and he was in first place right up until just a few weeks before the election, um, or I should say before election day, and then started to drop. So these numbers obviously are a snapshot of a moment in time, and you can't take it to the bank. But, you know, does Hudak appear to be a better candidate and a better leader, a more experienced, smarter leader today than he was a year ago or two years ago? Yes, he does. Is that enough to win the next election? Stay tuned. Thanks, Steve. Uh, I have um, a, uh, someone posting as a guest in our chat who wrote that Dalton McGinty received 85.8% support at his leadership review. So thank you, guest, for um, sending that in to us. Um, I've got another couple of questions that just came in, Steve. So another one is from uh, Tim Logan again. And here it is, Steve. Uh, thank you, Steve. I hope it's not a problem for me to try with another question. And Fire Tim, away, Tim. Absolutely not, yeah. And this one is probably harder for you, Steve. Uh, Tim writes, my generation isn't politically engaged, but it doesn't mean they are interested in societal issues. Unlike in years gone by, my generation gets involved with more single-issue advocacy groups like Amnesty. So if there is energy amongst young people my age to get involved with those kind of things, but how can that energy be translated into political engagement? Uh, for some reason, that's a great question, Tim, and for, for some reason... Uh, and I agree with you, and we've done numerous programs on this, so I've seen it firsthand where young people today, and by that I'm, let's, let's assume we're talking about people who are 25 years of age and younger. Young people today don't seem, um, they are interested in issues. Uh, they have moved policy. I remember um, 100,000 young people getting on Facebook saying that the new rules surrounding driver's licenses 
uh, were too onerous, and the Premier of Ontario, Dalton McGuinty, uh, changed his mind on his position, and, um, and, and, and the Facebook campaign won. And, you know, that was something that was led by young people, so what, you know, when they do get interested in an issue, they certainly are there. There's something about, and, and, you know, I think we could make a long list of what's to blame for this, but there's something about the way politics is practiced today that just does not connect with young people. And it may well be a lot of the arcane traditions that are around the Ontario legislature. It may well be uh, the rules by which we elect people. It may well be some of the theatricality and silliness of question period that just turns young people off. It may well be the way that media cover it all. It may well be the way politicians behave. It may well be that, that uh, Tim, when you were younger, uh, you didn't have an older sibling or a, a parent who took you to the polls on election day and said this is one of the most sacred and important duties we have as citizens it's called voting and I do it and you should do it too uh, I, I think that's hugely important and would urge you know everybody and anybody who's listening to this to take a younger person with them to the polls and show them the significance of that um, of that action I know it's something I did with all of my kids and I think uh, it's fair to say that all of them to a greater or lesser degree today are engaged not just in single issue politics but in um, you know in good old-fashioned partisan politics um, in part because their old man dragged them out to a lot of stuff when they were younger and they got a first-hand look at how how it all worked and they understand the importance of being a citizen and voting so uh, you know there's a lengthy list of a bunch of things Tim I think somewhere in the midst of all of that is a hopefully an answer to your question thanks Steve uh, I think that's an interesting uh little story you shared about taking your kids to vote and uh, my personal experience my my parents are from India they immigrated here um, in the early night actually mid 80s 1985 and I essentially grew up here and my parents have never voted they never took me to they never showed me and to this day they have never voted in any elections so do you vote Naveen? I do yes always always yeah it's and I'm the only one in my family my brother doesn't take part in politics either and kind of riffing off that question and your answer from Tim, do you think this is something that needs to be addressed in our schools? A hundred percent. We should, uh, and I don't think, I, I don't recall taking quote-unquote civics in school, but yeah, we should, uh, definitely. And you know what? Uh, I, I should also not make the assumption that it's the uh, older generation that needs to take the younger generation to the polls. Maybe in your case, Naveen, you need to drag your parents to the polls on election day and show them what voting's all about. And um, uh, you know, we're, we're at a point right now, and I don't know how accurate this number is. I know the last tur voter turnout for the Ontario election of a year ago was 50%. Um, I don't know how accurate that is because a lot of people get sent, uh, you know, a voter registration card to their home and their cottage and maybe their business. So, in fact, if they only vote at home and they don't vote in their cottage, it looks like a 50% turnout when in fact it was 100% turnout. So I don't know if it's really as bad as all of that, but you, the, the trend is unmistakable and it's going down. And, <clears throat> excuse me, we really do need to some, we do need to do something to get people more engaged because right now we have a government in Ontario, excuse me once again, <coughs> too much talking. We have a government in Ontario that got elected with 37.6% uh, of the votes cast and only 15 percent of the people cast votes so you've got a government that's basically there on the strength of 19 percent of Ontarians having voted for it at a certain point if the numbers keep going down the legitimacy you know of these results and of our governments is really going to come into question it's a bit scary thanks Steve and uh, I hope to take uh, you up on that I'll, I'll take my parents to vote next time and <laughs> I'll try to write about it so I think there's something we can do with that um, there's a question from Steve that just came in. Uh, Stephen Lee, he writes, I heard a rumor that the Ontario government is getting set to introduce its plan for seat redistribution. Have you heard any details on this? Uh, you know what? We are actually going to tape a program this afternoon for air tomorrow night all about this. Just to clarify, this is actually something that's being led by the federal government. Uh, the federal government it, at the moment has a commission in place which is looking at increasing the number of seats in the House of Commons from 308 to 338 I believe and what has been the tradition in Ontario is that when the feds change the boundaries uh, the Ontario boundaries change with them um, 
and you, you might remember back when Mike Harris was the premier in the mid to late 1990s, uh, they decided to uncouple. Uh, this this all started uh, almost 20 years ago. It they uncoupled the the federal and the Ontario boundaries, uh, which always used to be different. But Harris said, uh, you know, we're going to go with the same boundaries as the federal MPs so that there's not all this extra duplication and they got rid of about, I don't know, 20 some odd politicians. Well now they've decided that because of population increases and because of demographic changes within the country that they want to go to I think 15 more seats for the province of Ontario and at the moment I have not heard anything and Hillary Clark our producer of this program has got some calls in on this I have not heard anything as to whether or not the province of Ontario which would have to pass a law signing on to the federal boundary changes I haven't heard whether they're actually in the process of doing that. At the moment, they're not. But of course, we don't know when the next Ontario, we know when the next federal election will be. We don't know when the next Ontario election will be since it's a minority parliament and it could come at any time. So at the moment, it looks like we're going to be stuck with different boundaries <clears throat> federally and provincially again, which I don't know how much sense that makes. Now that we've spent um, whatever it is, you know, 15 plus years with the same boundaries, uh, it probably makes sense to try to do that again, but that will require Ontario passing a law which they haven't done yet. Great, thanks Steve, and just a reminder folks, we're probably going to be going till about um, or at or around 1.15 p.m. we'll end the chat. I've just got a number of questions that just came in from Mark, Mike, and John. I see them, we're going to do our best to get to them, we should be able to. And uh, first of all, I promised Doug I'd get to his question and I've just published it. Uh, here's Doug, Steve. Hi Steve. How challenging, it, how challenging is it to stay plugged in with provincial political players? Does yours and TVO's reputation open doors or close them? It seems to me the format of the agenda is pretty fair in giving all sorts of voices a platform to present their case. Well, I'm glad you see it that way, Doug. We certainly think so and we hope so. We, we hope we are uh, you know, a place where all different points of view can meet in a kind of a civilized and serious location to have a good discussion about things. Um, Funnily enough, I've never stopped to consider whether being a TVO helps or hurts. I, you know, probably a little of both, depending on who you're with. I know the fact that I think the thing that helps the most is our format. You know, we have an hour a night, no commercials, to tackle one or two topics. So you know that if you're going to be a guest on our program, you're actually going to be allowed to finish a sentence. Uh, you don't have to sum things up in 10-second clips as you would for the nightly news or for most other interview programs. Um, so. I think that's our greatest asset going for us is a good format, uh, a good format which allows us to drill deep and guests like the fact that they're going to come, they can say their piece, um, they can engage in a good debate and that they, um, you know, they're not going to be edited uh, as, as they would for anything else. Um, <clears throat> does TVO help or hurt? I don't know. I'd be interested in your view on that. I, I, to me, it's a neutral. To me, the best thing we've got going is the format. Thanks, Steve. And the next question is from Mark, who asks, is the whole government as stalled as it seems in terms of making any real policy changes? Is it minority paranoia? Um, minority paranoia, I don't know. Minority paralysis, maybe. Uh, the reality is, in a minority parliament, uh, you know, the government has got to find a partner for whatever it wants to do. And I guess, technically, given that this is such a major minority, uh, they really only have to find a couple of votes on the other side. So you need a, a couple of people to catch the uh, the 24-hour voting flu, as it were, if you want to get stuff through. Uh, but we've seen this happen. You know, I, I'm, I'm probably a little older than the people who are who have dialed in to participate in this, and I can certainly recall back in, from 1975 to 1981 that the Ontario government, led by William Davis, for six years uh, managed to tack left when necessary, tack right when necessary, get different parties to support them depending on what the occasion was you know um, and that that worked pr so well that Mr. Davis ended up in 1981 going back to the polls after um, six years of minority parliament and uh, getting a majority government which is you know really difficult to do it's it's hard to reclaim a majority after you've lost it and he managed to do it and I think um, you know Harper's done it I think Trudeau did it um, Boy, maybe William Lyon Mackenzie King. I think there's precious few people in Canadian history who've who've been able to reclaim a majority after only having had a minority. So, um, is it harder to get anything through? Absolutely. Is there all sorts of uh, drama and theatricality 
as uh, you know, they try to get stuff passed, for sure. Um, but you know, there's one thing hanging over everybody during the course of all of this, and that is knowing what the people think about going back to the polls too early. Nobody wants to be accused of being the one who was responsible for pulling the plug on this parliament. So uh, everybody has to be pretty careful in the way that they manage this scenario. Thanks, Steve. And we've got three more questions, and that's about all we're going to be able to get to today. So I just want to thank everyone for joining the chat again today. And uh, we're going to get to those three questions and then finish up. So we'll start with uh, Mike C., who writes that he just saw a CBC article this morning that McGinty has rejected OPSU's offer for a wage freeze. Does right. that mean the Liberals are likely planning to go further and make deeper cuts, Steve? Uh, I can't predict the future. I don't know if they're going to make deeper cuts. I know that uh, I, I saw the same thing you did, and uh, it, it looks like, I mean, I guess there's, it, there are two approaches to this, presumably, or at least two approaches, maybe more. Certainly the conservative approach, had Tim Hudak been premier, was, we're going to pass a law freezing everybody's salary for two years. The liberals' approach seems to be, uh, we're going to go after you sector by sector by sector and, and offer these two-year freezes. And then we've seen an approach that the NDP talked about, which is, uh, I think, being pursued in Manitoba, for example, where they actually do sit down, they collectively bargain, and in Manitoba, at any rate, they've managed to successfully conclude uh, some contract, um, some collective bargaining uh, with the 0% increases that the government was looking for. And somehow they've managed to find, um, you know, they, they, they have found... Uh, maybe enhancements in other areas, maybe they were able to, who knows what, do some different things on, on benefits or in workplace issues that the union was happy enough with that they were able to accept a 0% increase. Obviously, uh, the Catholic teachers took a 0% increase over two years, so we know that it, it can be negotiated, but it just appears at the moment <clears throat> that a political decision has been made not to negotiate it. And, uh, you know, we'll see how this turns out. I think it's an interesting... It's a great story to cover and an interesting problem for the Liberals because we know the Liberals didn't get elected on the basis of promising austere government. Uh, we know they got elected on the promise of rebuilding public services, in particular health and education. That was the job that they campaigned on and that was the job that they won on. Uh, I don't think there are too many people out there who voted for the Ontario Liberals because they were confident in their ability to bring austerity to the public um, purse. Uh, they didn't campaign on it and um, you know when you think austerity you don't necessarily think liberals first when it comes to the province of Ontario. You think conservatives first. So you know whether they'll be able to do it is an open question and we'll keep watching it. Here's a question from you from John Steve. Do you think the constant feed of polling results impact whether or not people are engaged in voting and or politics in general? I've never known about polls. You know, polls are snapshots, and, and you know, I remember Bob Ray when his premier once upon a time said, my job is not to be a prisoner of the polls, my job is to move polls. And that's what leaders do. Uh, leaders move polls. They are not slaves to polls. And while it is certainly not a bad thing to take a snapshot in time and see what the public may think on a certain issue, I think any politician or any leader that does or that takes a, a particular position because that's what the public thinks, doesn't understand what leadership's about. Uh, leadership is about understanding what a poll might tell you in terms of where the public is, and then it should help you by giving you the information you need to know in order to help move the public to where you think it ought to go. And maybe where they are is where you think they ought to go, but if you don't think so, um, then polling can be helpful to, to help you know what argument makes the best sense to get people to where you think we ought to go. Um, I, you know, I, I can't tell when you publish polls before an election whether they influence the public at all. I don't know whether it has a bandwagon effect. I don't know whether it has the contrary effect whereby people say, oh my goodness, these guys are going to win. Let's go over and give these other guys some help. Uh, I've seen both happen. Uh, I've seen people jump on the bandwagon and I've seen people say, oh my goodness, these guys look close to a majority. We better, you know, We'd better go somewhere else. Um, and I don't even, I think pollsters can't even give you a good answer to that question. I don't even think they know. Thanks, Steve. Um, the last question uh, of our chat this afternoon comes from KS, and it's about uh, the 
electoral boundaries being redrawn. I think you can uh, you can sort this one out. Uh, does the party which draws the electoral boundaries have much advantage? Should the boundaries be geometric rather than shaped to political purpose? Okay, first things first, the parties don't pick the boundaries, and that is hugely important. That makes us completely different from the United States, where the parties do pick the boundaries, and as a result, they have what's called gerrymandered um, <clears throat> the boundaries. You know, they'll make ridings look look like this. <laughs> you know, they'll they'll make the boundaries any ways in order to include uh, the the pockets in those areas that are most felicitous to their purposes, and we don't allow that here. We have a neutral commission, and in fact, if you watch our program tomorrow night, you will see an interview with the judge who is in charge of this process. Uh, we have a neutral commission whose job it is, um, so directed by Parliament, to add uh, whatever, how many seats is it again? Is it 33 seats? I think 33 more seats to Parliament, something like that. Uh, wait a minute, 308 to 338, that's it from 308 to 338, that's the overarching mandate. So f create these new seats, but the parties don't get a say in what the boundaries for the new seats are. It is strictly up to this nonpartisan neutral commission uh, to decide what the boundaries are. Now, geometric shapes? Uh, usually not. Usually what they try to go for is they try for an average of 120,000 uh, constituents per riding. And what they try to do is draw boundaries that will get you within 5% of that 120,000 up or down as often as possible. Now, every now and then they have to make an exception to that because if you go, for example, to Kenora in northwestern Ontario, which is the size of Germany, um, you know, there's 55,000 people who live in Kenora. So if you were going to create a riding of 120,000 people, you'd be creating a riding the size of Europe, never mind Germany, and that's simply ridiculous for one person to represent. So, key point to understand here is our process, I think, is better. It's neutral. It's nonpartisan. The politicians are certainly able to go to the traveling uh, committee uh, hearings and make their case for why they think the boundaries ought to be, say, on you know one side of the street versus another. They're certainly enabled to, uh, able to do that. But the final decision is not the prime minister's or the premier's. It's this commission's, and that's the way it should be. Great. Thank you, Steve. Uh, that, that concludes our chat for uh, this afternoon. I uh, just want to thank you again for taking the time and thanks to everyone who sent in questions and some feedback. And you can watch this chat again on replay right here on our website. And stay tuned. We will do this again. So thank you, Steve. And thanks to you, Naveed, for moderating. And thanks to everybody who got questions in. And, and uh, send us your feedback. You know, if my answers are too long or too convoluted, let me know that. I'm, uh, you know, this is a bit of a new thing for us and we're feeling our way through it. I know I got a tweet from somebody earlier today saying, why are you doing it you know, over the noon hour as opposed to another time of day? And, uh, you know, we've tried mid-afternoon. We're now trying the noon hour. We'll try one in prime time and just see what um, the preponderance of our, of our uh, what do you call them, viewers seem, uh, seem to prefer. So we'll, we'll keep trying stuff, but we need your feedback, and we're open to it. Uh, I believe users is the correct term, Steve. And from some of the feedback we did get in the chat, uh, people are enjoying the format. They're appreciative of the the quick and detailed response you're able to give to each question right away. And I think that that's what works best in this format. So uh, Steve's right, send us your feedback and we'll continue to, to work with this and make it the best we can. So thanks again, everyone, and have a great afternoon. Thanks, Naveen. So long.